Oil giant Chevron says that it will grow its oil and gas production more than 20 percent by 2017, 25 percent. And so far this year, investors have been rewarded with a 9 percent gain in the stock. Joining me right now in a CBC exclusive is John Watson. He's chairman and CEO of Chevron. Good to have you on the program, John. Maria, thanks for having me. You had your analyst meeting today, and that was one of the headlines that came out of the meeting, growing oil and gas production by 25 percent by 2017. How are you going to do that? Well, Maria, there were two things that I talked about with the analysts. One was our performance, which we've grown earnings per share faster, cash flow per share faster, and our stock price has performed. But I also talked about what we have going forward, which is the 25% production growth. And our growth is really centered in Australia and the Gulf of Mexico. I talked about two big LNG projects that we have, liquefied natural gas in Australia that will bring gas to the growing markets of Asia. And I talked about some big deep water developments, uh, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, which will contribute to that growth. Is Morocco a an opportunity for you? I know these are the, the main priorities, the ones that you just mentioned. Well, Morocco is an area where we picked up some acreage recently. In fact, we've entered uh, half a dozen or so countries. Those are longer term plays. Those are exploration plays where we'll do seismic work and then drill. And then if we have discoveries, we'll have production. I think the important point is we are investing and we've had an exploration record that is second to none over the last 10 years. I want to get back to the Gulf of Mexico because we all know that it has been tough for oil companies to get the permits required to actually operate and get the get the product in, in that region. So I'll, I'll come back to that because one of the big talks at the uh, analyst meeting was all the cash on the books, $22 billion in cash on the books. What are you planning to do with that money? Well, our financial priorities have been to pay and increase the dividend and increase the dividend as the pattern of future earnings and cash flow permit. That's why we're making the investments for growth in the future. We've kept a little bit more cash on our balance sheet than some other companies. One, because we've generated more cash from our investments, but also because there can be ups and downs in the oil markets around the world, and we have these big projects underway, and we need to have a bit of a cash reserve in the event that oil prices were to go down, which we don't expect, but, but may happen, or in the event that exchange rates or other costs are impacted. Or you have a disaster uh, that a, an oil company uh, can actually be afflicted. I mean, like a spill somewhere, or an issue, a verdict against you in Ecuador. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you want to have that build up. Well, there are risks in our business, but actually one of the things I told uh, the analysts is that we have the best safety record in the industry. We had our best spill performance ever. In fact, uh, we're the best in the industry when it comes to spill performance. And when it comes to Ecuador, that's a pretty well-documented fraud, and I've got no intention of paying paying the, the plaintiff's lawyers who perpetrated this fraud. You know, the, the latest evidence that we have in this case is a judge that was bribed in Ecuador came forward and gave testimony in the United States and corroborating bank record information supporting our contention of fraud. So we're keeping cash on the balance sheet for the ups and downs of the commodity cycles, um, not because we're expecting to have uh, those sorts of unusual payments. Sounds like you're facing a shakedown of sorts. Well, that is what's happening yeah. in, in Ecuador, and uh, the only way we can resolve it is uh, through international courts, or we've tried to engage uh, with uh, President Crea in, in Ecuador. Uh, thus far, we haven't been successful, but we'll defend ourselves against this fraud and uh, look forward to continuing our investments elsewhere. All right, so you raised your dividend for 25 straight years? We have. Uh, every time you've raised a dividend somewhere around the second, you raised your di dividend last in the second quarter of last year. That's right. So uh, you're not going to miss this year, 2013, dividend increase coming in the second quarter, John. Well, well we've increased the dividend uh, over the last 25 years, and uh, I'm not going to get out ahead of any dividend increase going forward, but we understand that our shareholders value uh, steady growth in the dividend, and we invest to make sure that we can do that. Connect the dots, uh, if you will. Okay, let's talk about shale, because this is a story I am so hot on. I love the shale exploration and production story. Uh, last week, we had on the CEO of ConocoPhillips, and he talked about the opportunity with me uh, last week uh, about, uh, about shale. Listen to what he had to say. Do we have that sound bite? Well, it's tremendous. It's a, it's a renaissance for our country, certainly for our industry, and for our company as well at ConocoPhillips. It's driving tremendous changes. Just go to North Dakota and see what's happening up there in the state, what we're doing here in Texas, what's happening in Colorado, what's happening in Ohio. It is changing the landscape, and it's changing it for the better, helping this economy grow. These are good, high-paying jobs with great benefits coming uh, in, in this industry. Is that the way you see it? Uh, I think those comments are spot on. You know, there's an opportunity to generate a couple of trillion dollars in tax revenue over the next 20 years. There's an opportunity to generate millions of additional jobs 
all we have to do is have a regulatory environment that allows development to take place. Uh, we have to have a fiscal system in place instead of thinking about imposing punitive taxes on our industry. And we need to have uh, an environment that uh, gives us the permits that we need to produce. Well, it's an interesting point because, you know, it's the same idea as we're seeing in the Gulf. The regulatory environment and the lack of permitting, uh, permitting that everyone is waiting for has stopped or slowed down production. So let me ask you about that. What specifically, in terms of the regulation out there, is, is hurting or slowing things down? Well, what we'd like to see is more acreage made available. If you look in the Gulf of, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and around the outer continental shelf of the United States, 85% of our acreage is, is not available. And in fact, the oil and gas production increase that we're benefiting from in this country, we're not seeing it on federal lands. We're actually seeing declining production on federal lands. So we need to have those lands made available and we need to have timely issuance of permits. And uh, we also need to be sure that the, that the EPA is uh, enforcing prudent environmental laws, but not going too far. I guess part of it is obviously the environment. You've got, you know, people right now protesting the Keystone Pipeline. So can you ensure, categorically say, that this is not going to impact the environment, that this is actually not going to move the needle in terms of uh, affecting our wildlife, our, you know, nature? Maria, we have two and a half million miles of pipelines in this country. Uh, and they're, they're everywhere in this country, including in the area covered by the Keystone Pipeline. We can, we can put in pipelines and produce from pipelines very effectively. Uh, obviously, we have to take the right precautions in our industry. We have to have sound environmental practices, and uh, but but we have a good track record, and it's getting better all the time. I thought it was interesting that you know the administration released the results of that uh, examination into pipeline on a Friday night at five o'clock at night. It sort of went unnoticed, but the bottom line is what came out of that report was that it is not harmful to the environment. Well, no. We're going to need oil and gas for a long time in this country, and Canada has been a good trading partner with us for many years. It makes sense to bring that oil to the United States rather than have Canada export it to another part of the world. So what would be an appropriate growth rate? Having said all that, let's say you do get what you want, and, and, and the regulatory story turns in the industry's favor. I don't know. It's 50-50, really, if that actually does happen. But if it were to happen, what kind of a growth rate would shareholders uh, look to expect from Chevron? Well, we're spending 36.7 billion dollars this year and about a quarter of that spending is in the United States. We are making significant investments in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania and in West Texas and New Mexico with the acreage that we have which is uh, which which is we've added to in, re in the recent past. Uh, so if we have more acreage being available I would hope that a higher proportion of our spending would come to the United States but fundamentally we go where the opportunities are and if more opportunities made available We'll put more money to work here in the U.S. Do you think the U.S. will become an oil export, an energy exporter at some point, like we've talked about so much? I think we could become an energy exporter. It'll be very difficult to be a, a, an oil exporter. I, what I see is we'll be producing more natural gas than we need, and we can export that. We'll st we're still likely to see imports of liquid fuels, of oil, uh, going forward. But we can certainly make a big dent in those imports by allowing more investment. And real quick, front and center today is the budget. Uh, Paul Ryan coming out with his proposal. Are you expecting that you're going to lose some subsidies and tax breaks that oil companies have right now as a result of bu the, the new budget proposals? Maria, Chevron had a 43% effective tax rate last year. No industry pays more taxes than we do. Uh, to me, it's been a false narrative around our industry. We pay our fair share of taxes. Now, I am in favor of comprehensive tax reform, and some of the provisions that we benefit from, that other industries benefit from, uh, certainly those can be a part of the debate on lowering tax rates. But what I've seen so far is increases in tax rates, and I haven't seen uh, any discussion about comprehensive tax reform uh, put forward concretely. I'm glad you mentioned that, because there's so much talk that the oil companies are evil, and, and, and yet you look at the numbers and it's an extraordinary number in terms of the taxes that you pay. $20 billion in income taxes last year for, as for Chevron. As an industry, just $20 billion just for Chevron oil. Good to have you on the program, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks Maria. very much for joining us. Appreciate John Watson is chairman and CEO at Chevron.